what you know about PE fitness. A more in-depth look on Dylan Jamelli's business. The number one channel for performance enhancement. They need more education. Searching for muscle advance. Can't learn it from a book or a pamphlet. Tune in for the answers because your body's too precious to take any chances. I didn't try my first arm, actually, until I think 24. So many buddies that I guess they think trend is like the only steroid out there. Oh. They don't really know anything about it. So they'll come to me. They're like, you know, Ed, I'm thinking of uh, hopping on some trend soon. You think that's a good idea? Uh. I'm like, are you fucking stupid? Like, what are you? If I didn't love my fucking hair so much, I'd pull it out from that nonsense. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And there's no reason to dive headfirst in and just go for craziness. Like if you're learning to play basketball, do you start shooting fucking three pointers or do you start and work your way out? All right, everyone, I have a very, very special guest today. So for everybody out there, this is Ed Eason. <laughs> Dylan, thank you for having me on today, man. Excited to be here, ready to get to it, you know? Hell yes, man. I'm really glad to have you on. Very excited, as I've told you as we've been talking. So guys, Ed has done a ton Super, super intriguing guy. Tons of followers on Instagram. Great videos. But there's a lot more to it than just some of the things you see on social media. And I really want you guys to get to know Ed. We're going to talk about a lot of his background. We're going to get into some of his schooling, some PED stuff. So you absolutely want to listen to all of this. So, Ed, I want to kind of talk to you. What kind of drew me to you first to even have me reach out was some of the the MTV, the Netflix stuff that you've done. I mean, because obviously you start seeing those types of things. It's like immediate intrigue. So tell everybody about kind of how that got going for you, what you did, what your experience was like, because we all want to hear about it. Yeah, man, it's crazy. I always say like I'm kind of good at like falling into random shit. I don't know how <laughs> or why this stuff happens. Somehow it does. I never planned to be on TV. That was never a goal of mine, but... It just happened. I, I took the opportunity. I mean, it's funny story how it happened, actually. Um, yeah. This was back, gosh, 2018, 2019, probably. I did my first show in 2019 for, uh, for Netflix. It was The Circle. Season nice. one, brand new show coming out. So uh, nobody had heard of it yet. It was, it was still just a concept. And I got a message on Instagram from some lady who I guess was a scout. Um, they had them all over, you know, the United States looking in major cities. So I guess somebody was in Philly. She's like, Hey man, like we're looking on Instagram, uh, like Tinder, even like, we're just out there looking for people. We right. stumbled across your Instagram. You seem like a funny guy. Like I just post dumb shit on Instagram all the time. <laughs> and I mean, at the time I was just a normal kid, like 2000 followers, no, nothing special. Uh, never did any like TV or none of that. But right. she reached out. I'm like, yeah, sure. Send me an application. Like thinking she's kind of joking. Sent an application. It looked legit. Filled it out. They called me in for an interview. They're like, we'd love to have you down. I'm like, whoa, this might be a real TV opportunity here. So I guess I killed the first interview. Nice. They flew me out to LA to do another interview. Next thing you know, they're like, boom, you're casted for the show. So it happened so fast and I wasn't expecting it at all. I didn't go looking for it, but we just kind of stumbled onto it. I had a blast with it, and that ended up getting me seen by MTV. So right. they reached out to me, said, yo, we saw you on Netflix. We'd love to have you on our show. <laughs> Dude, that is and, – and it's crazy how random that shit happens. And it's hard because I'm assuming, you know, when you have any kind of following – or do anything cool on Instagram, you're going to get bombarded with all kinds of scams and spams, and it's hard to sift through that shit. So kudos oh, yeah. to you for finding somebody that actually was legit, following through with it. And because sometimes you could delete things and be like, yeah, fuck this, because I've done that and been like, oh, shit, why did I do that? You know, so that's awesome, man. Congratulations. Yeah, the odds of it happening, like everybody always asks me, they're like, I'm thinking of applying, like, what did you do? How did you do it? And I was like, shit, like it was an accident, man. I really don't know what to tell you. <laughs> that is so, so cool. So tell me a little bit about first, like the Netflix experience and, and kind of like what it was like to do what you did. And, and I'm also curious, and I'm sure everybody is, what's it like behind the scenes? Like, what do you kind of encounter and 
what what are the people like? What's I mean, what's the fucking catering like? You know what I mean? Because you hear stories about everything. So just kind of talk about it a little bit because I'm curious myself. I know. Yeah, everybody wants to know, like, what goes on there? Like, what did you do? And uh, it's kind of funny. I mean, so I did this show uh, for Netflix right after I graduated college. So I graduated in 2019. Um, around May. And then I think it was August we left to go film, uh, the circle. Right. Before that, I had gotten hired, um, as an engineer at my first job, like a month or two into my job. I'm like, Hey, are you guys cool if I take a break to go film a TV show? They were like, (laughs) what? So, (laughs) Oh, you're good. All right. Are we good? (laughs) Yeah, we're good. We're gold. It happens. Yeah. So, I asked my work, I'm like, yo, are you cool if I take a break to go film a TV show real quick? They're like, uh, all right, man, like, how long are you going to be gone? Uh, we ended up working out the details where they let me go, they let me do it, and I ended up being away for a month to film the show. Right. But the first, like, two weeks, like, there was no filming of the show going on. They brought us over, they smacked us in a hotel. And everything was very secretive. Like, I guess they didn't want us to meet other members of the cast by accident. Right. Makes so sense. Anytime that, like, they would take us somewhere, like, for lunch, we had a chaperone. <clears throat> and if they were to drive us somewhere, like, we had to put, like, a blindfold on driving places. Now, we could walk around places, but our chaperone, I guess, was always on the phone making sure, hey, like, we can't run into anybody. We got to keep you guys right. away from people. So for the first two weeks, we were just kind of chilling, hanging out, you know, shooting some promo stuff like our little intros and pictures. But no show stuff was going on for about, you know, the first 15, 16 days. So then you finally get in the show. And I'll tell you what, the circle, everybody asks, like, how was it? You're trapped in a room. You don't get to, like, see anybody. You're just Uh, locked away. No phone. No TV. There was no clocks in there. Like, I didn't know what time it was. No. So, it was, like, you kind of go crazy in there. That one is a show where, like, you got to be pretty mentally tough or (laughs) you're going to lose it. (laughs) When they – so – were you briefed ahead of time? Like, Hey, there's going to be two weeks where we don't do anything. And they probably don't tell you all of that when you go, do they, or do they? I was fully expecting to get there and just start TV. Uh, so we got there. It was like a week went by. They're like, Oh, any day now, any day now. And then like another wow. week went by. They're like any day now. Like, and to be honest, I think the people that I was talking to, um, at least who was working with me on the show, I think the higher ups don't tell them anything because they're telling me they're like, dude, really, honestly, like I have no idea what's going on. So I can't really give you much information. So the way TV works, it's such a shit show sometimes. It's amazing that they even manage to get these things out. I understand. And it's every type of show is different. So when I was kind of like your age doing that, um, I was on the wire as an extra and I'm telling you what, man, it was like, it, it was more so I kind of knew what was going to go on to a point, but I get, we'd get there at like 530 in the morning and it wouldn't be done till eight o'clock at night. Yep. And, you know, it's, it's such a long day and I don't know how it was with you, but like the very, very main, main characters had their own trailer there, but pretty much everybody else was just kind of all standing around talking together and, and everything's different. Right. But man, I don't think people realize how long those days are and how you it just to do like a five minute scene, the hours it takes to do it, the setup and, and it's fucking nerve wracking and long. Yeah. Uh, You know how it is. It drains you. It is not easy stuff. No. And, and if you have to do that for like weeks on end straight, because I think people think, Oh, it's glamorous. You're an actor. It's this It's easy. You just go talk and act. And that that's not it at all. Um, No, you would know firsthand by doing this. So, and when you did, did did it extend like several, several weeks or how long did it go when you actually started filming it? All right. So this thing too. Yeah. The circle, very short. We'll get to MTV because the MTV was long, long, long. (laughs) My time in the circle, four or five days. Wow. That's it. I think on TV, they make it seem like it's a lot longer. Sure. Granted, we were there a month. The first, you know, two, almost three weeks was a lot of just farting around. 
And then my actual time on the show, four or five days, and then boom, I'm out. So it actually happened quick, but it was the longest four or five days of my life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Did, so on that, did, how did they compensate you or did they compensate you well? Um, and and like, so for me, it was like, well, you're going to get this X amount for your day's work. And they cut my agent a check and all of that. How did it work for you? Because I know they're all different. Yeah, I guess this one was like pretty low budget because it was the first season of this first show coming out. Sure. They paid us like by the week, like how many weeks we were there. So we were all okay. there. It ended up being four weeks or so. Right. But I think everybody made more work in their normal jobs. Sure. Than actually on the show. We just kind of did it for the experience. I can't believe we even said yes <laughs> to the, the money that they offered us. But I guess, yeah, we were excited. Well, and, and I think that people watching should understand because like, I modeled for several years and I was in Milan in Italy and you would think, Oh my God, you're doing that. You're just, Oh, he's fucking got it all. And I, a lot of this stuff when, when people do this and it's kind of like with YouTube, when we do our videos, it's for the exposure and it's not so much for the paycheck. Yep. Right. So you being on that, for example, that gets you several opportunities, MTV, for example, and put your name out there. But I think people need to understand you go do this stuff. Like I, when I got to model in Milan, that's like the world series, but I go there and there's 300 of the best looking guys in the world. Right. And they, there's like five guys that get all the jobs. So I'm over there making jack shit. It's almost costing me to be there. It's the experience, you know, yeah, getting it's just getting there. yourself up on that stage. Yes. You know, it's not really, people do make careers out of it, but I Absolutely. still come back and I work my normal job. So, right, right. you know, it just, it opens you up opportunities. Plus you go back to work and, and people are eventually like, holy fuck, I saw you. I, I mean, it's kind of cool, but it, I think people should understand. And it's obviously done well for you. Um, and it, it helps many people, but you can, guys, it, it's just like YouTube. There's very few people that monetize and make a fuckload of money. It's like, I do it to get clients, right? You know, and, yeah. and I'm sure you do it for whatever purposes that you have, but I don't think people get it you know, so no. especially with the YouTube, I started to try and really build my YouTube channel. It's starting off pretty slow. I got my first like 80 or 90 so videos out. Yeah. And the amount of time that I put in and the returns, like no. not really making any money at all off of this. Hopefully no. someday, but for now it's, it's really no. just to start laying the foundation. And you, so you built your Instagram extremely strong and I'm assuming that being on the show has helped you to build that. Oh, Is big that, time. Okay. All right. Because I mean, instantly it's like, okay, they see you, they know your name. Let's follow him. Let's follow him. Let's follow him. And then you, you put out great content. So it's really, the word spreads fast, but for YouTube, it's different because that takes years. Yeah. Unless you do something extremely viral, which I have extreme confidence that you will. And the goal here for me is to get more people to see and learn about you because you've got so much going on and I want people to see your personality. A lot of things when, when we do YouTube videos, people see uh, a character, right? Because of what you're doing, but they need to get to know you. And that's kind of what I'm after here. Um, so after we talk about MTV, I want to get into you a little bit and kind of talk about, like we were talking about your schooling. I find that intriguing, but I would really be intrigued on how MTV how they approached you and, and the experience there. Cause I'm assuming it's different than what you experienced with Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. So after I did the Netflix show, I came back, um, it came out, we watched it. Everything was great. And I actually had a few people come up to me, some friends, some family, but I was surprised at how many people actually came up and said the same thing. They were like, Ed, you did great on the circle, but like, we would love to see you like on the challenge. That's more your style show. Yeah. At the time, I never watched an episode of the challenge. Didn't know what it was. All I knew was it's a physical competition series. Sure. And every time somebody said that, like I, I, it was a handful of people, four or five. Like I got it many times. Like, oh, you better apply for the challenge. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, maybe one day I will. Maybe one day I will. Sure enough, maybe a year or so after the the circle aired, somebody from MTV reaches out to me saying, wow. "Hey, Ed." We saw you on the circle. We'd love to have you apply for the challenge if you're interested. And at this time, I'm like, oh, shit. I still didn't watch an episode of it yet. Like, 
But it was funny because, like, the foreshadowing of it, I was like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll apply for that one day. We'll see. People kept bugging me about it. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you know, well, maybe in the future. And then, sure enough, like, it, it, I, I can't make this up. I keep falling into these TV shows, and it's not like I'm going searching for it. But somehow they found me. I don't know, man. But, brother, that's a testament to how fucking good you do and how intriguing you are. So that's good on you. Now, I... I would implore you to utilize this and reach out more and be more proactive. If I was your agent, I'd be like, come on, motherfucker, let's go. You got the talent because you clearly got the talent. I mean, that's I could tell that from the first time I talked to you that I could hear the charisma on the phone and from watching you. So um, I can tell you that because I've been around talent for so many years and I'm not a scout or a genius, but I've seen it. So you have it. But um, when they approached you, did they reach out to you on Instagram by email or what did they do? Instagram, yep. Instagram, that's awesome. Went right into the DMs. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> and here I am. Oh, funny, yeah. So I went back to my job, and you know I'm working there for another year, year and a half, or whatever goes by, and I'm like, hey, got an <laughs> opportunity to do another show. I'm thinking it was like a one and done. Like the circle was all right. That was cool, but now back to real life. I'm an engineer. That's what I do. Sure. Second show comes up. They're like, hey. You can't keep doing this. So we're like, we're going to hold your job as long as we can. But if you're gone too long, we're going to have to let you go. I'm like, oh, all right, well, shit. fucking opportunity's calling. I'm taking it. Yeah. So is are you still at this same job that you were at? Now I'm at a different job. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Um, What was your experience like on MTV? How long were you there and what was their pay like? And what was it like behind the scenes there compared to like what you experienced on Netflix? Yeah. So MTV, uh, well, the first season of the challenge, pretty brutal starting off. It was right when COVID was hitting. Uh... So listen to this. We fly over there. We're in uh, Croatia. Beautiful place. Beautiful. That's sick. But they stick us in a hotel. They're like, you got to do a 10-day quarantine. Uh, so everybody's in their own hotel rooms, but you can't leave the room at all. So I'm stuck in the room. I can walk out on the balcony, and we're, like, yelling to each other from, like, balcony to balcony. You're like, yo, are you all right? <laughs> like, checking in on each other. Some people were losing it. Like, some of the guys that were there, you know, doing it 5, 10, 15 years, they're like, I don't know if I can take this. Like, I'm done. Like, I'm about to leave. Because this was the first, you know, real quarantine that that we ever had to do for, like, a TV show. Right. And, yeah, I think COVID really started getting to people because they were, like, losing hope. Like, day three, day four. I'm like, we got 10 days of this. Anyway, they call everybody in. It was, like, day 10 or 11. All right, we're going to go leave for uh, filming. We're going into the house. And at that point, I'm, like, so excited. I'm like, yes, let's go. Four of us, they told us, whoa, 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 whoa. You four, you're going to stay in the hotel. You guys are going to be alternates just in case somebody gets hurt. And right. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I flew all the way out here, just spent 10 days in a hotel, and now I'm an alternate? Wow. Well, day, like, one in the in the show filming, somebody comes down with COVID. They pull the whole cast out. Everybody has to quarantine for another, like, 14 days. Ugh. What the fuck? So it was like damn near 25 days of quarantine in hotel. And I guess uh, the dude that got sick, they uh, they pulled him out of the show. They're like, all right, Ed, he's sick. We need you in there. He, he can't go back on the show. So thank God. I mean, like, not thank God, but like it happened the way it happened. Sure. I got an opportunity to go in, but it was after 25 days of sitting in a hotel room just on our own, like, no talking to like any, I mean, like we could yell at each other from the balcony, but like, it's not like you're going out exploring. You're not like, I was sitting there lifting the chairs in the hotel, like doing push ups, staring at walls. So that was almost, I mean, I think the circle kind of prepared me for that. Sure. So I, you know, I guess that was good. But then the challenge itself, oh, what an experience. Like that one is definitely more up my alley, man. It is like a physical competition series and, I like it because everybody on there, you know, they all are like reality, like TV kids. And they they think they're like these badass athletes. They're like, oh, man, like 
I was D one back in college. And I'm like, well, yeah, but now you're like almost 40 dude. Like, you're right. Exactly. So I was kind of like the young, like fresh meat on the show. I think when, uh, I did my first season, I was 24. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I was really one of the younger guys. There was not many of us, you know, mid twenties. Right. And I was out there just hungry, ready to compete, <laughs> like, oh, like a dog yeah. foaming at the mouth. But I had a blast with it, like doing some of the craziest shit. Like we're jumping out of like helicopters and off of cliffs into the ocean, swimming through caves, like strapped down to the back of cars while they're drifting around shit, wow. like action movie stuff. How so, was that too? Like the scenery in Croatia, was it pretty fucking sweet? I mean, doing that? Uh, it's so, I didn't realize where it was at first. I'm yeah. like, all right, what part of the world's Croatia in? I didn't know it was like right next to like Greece, Italy. Like yeah. I it was over there somewhere. Yes. But yeah, it's right near Greece and Italy, like on the Adriatic Sea. And oh. they got some, some nice landscapes. It's, I think they filmed a, a couple of like the Game of Thrones episodes there. Yeah, I think so. I think I that think was in so. Croatia. And it's cool because I you were kind of in Europe about the same age that I was in Europe. Um, I think I was twenty five. I fucked my years up really bad, but it, I was like the same age. It's 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 a crazy experience because we're. I mean, at that age, even now, you're still really young, but it's like whoa, this is it's crazy different. And people don't the people that don't go there. Like I stepped on a scale and it said like seventy five, and I'm like, wait a minute, you know, because it's in kilograms. And yeah, I start driving. I don't know if you drove or not, but I, I was in the airport in Milan and I started driving and the car said I was going like 70 and people are zooming by me and I'm like, what the fuck? But it was kilometers an hour and I didn't realize it, you know, yeah. and it, it, everything's different because I think that people that haven't been anywhere, the U S is the only place that has a metric system. So I'm sure it was crazy for you when you first got there. Um, with everything, money, I mean, just everything, the power when you're plugging shit in. Like, I accidentally plugged my laptop in and it almost fucking blew up because I forgot the adapter, you know? Oh, and, everybody yeah. was, like, frying their blow dryers and their covers yeah. because the European outlets are different than – they were all blowing up, yeah. Yeah, you have to have an adapter. And at the time, I remember I bought mine at fucking Radio Shack that don't even exist. But there's a lot of shit that you need to know before you go travel to Europe that I'm sure they didn't educate you on before you went over there, right? I mean – no, not at all. I didn't even know where I was going. Listen to this. They uh, they told me, yup, you're you're going to go on the challenge. Uh, you're flying out. Uh, I think they sent me it like three days prior. They're like, you're flying out. Like, you're part of the cast. Like, get ready. So I'm like, oh, shit, that's in three days. Like, I, like <laughs> it's very last minute. Right. They didn't tell me where I was flying until I got to the airport and somebody Whoa. from the show handed me my ticket and said, this is the plane you get on. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, Croatia. I'm like trying to Google real quick, like how far a flight that is. Like, well, when are we going to get there? And they're like, oh, no, you got to hand in your phones now, too. So I'm wow. like, I don't know where the fuck we're going. Like somewhere Croatia. I know it's over in Europe somewhere. But well, what about like a passport? Did they tell you you needed a passport or anything like beforehand? Or how did that go? They said we needed a passport. And they told us dress for weather within this temperature. That but was then it. If so, they don't tell you how long you're there, then how much shit do you know to bring? You know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, they told us pack like, you know, five to 10, you know, different outfits for like athletic wear, okay. fashion dress. Because they gave us kind of like a list, but it wasn't very specific that would tell you, you know, where in the world you're going. Wow. That's nuts, bro. Like, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. That's crazy. So how yeah. long... How long total were you there? It was about eight or nine weeks. Wow. Yeah. How'd that go with your job? <laughs> oh, yeah. I think they said, uh, we'll give you a month. If it's longer than a month, then uh, we got to cut you off. So wow. it was obviously way longer than a month. Sure. I was wondering if because of COVID, if they had kind of scaled back or how they handled that or what, but I guess that's a long time to just bounce, especially after you'd already gone before. So I get it. Damn. Yeah. They're like, if you're going to keep doing this, I was like, well, yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah. Shit. So what did you do when you got home then? So I got home. Um, I chilled out for a couple months, actually. I tried to start, you know, living the influencer life a little bit. And then I was like, all right, got nah, I got to go back to work. So sure. Sure. <laughs> after a few months, I found another job. 
um, right back into engineering. I started off actually, my first job was, uh, doing helicopters. Wow. I was in aviation and now I work in like, uh, the diesel emissions industry. So we do a lot of, uh, engine testing, stuff like that. So I kind of like the automotive side a little bit more, actually. I mean, sure. that's just my preference, man. <laughs> I'm going to get into that with you in a minute because that's hardcore in terms of what you got going on up here. I just want to ask you, um, how much did they compensate you with MTV? And then did you say you did a second season also on that? Yeah. So MTV, they do more of a tier system where okay. it's like your first season, you get this. Then season two through four, you get this. Then season I got two. So not great my first season. A little bit more than the circle. Yeah. But still, I was like, all right, I'm kind of making more money as an engineer than, right. you know, being on MTV. But, you know, for the exposure, I'm going to do it. It's going to be fun. It's going to be experienced that, like, nobody else on this earth is like, like, how how rare is that to be like, all right, I'm going to go film this reality show for MTV in Croatia. Like, yeah. I mean, bro, on your resume and your experience and your exposure, what that does for you I mean, let's just say you wanted to start a clothing line or start selling apparel or start uh, coaching people, whatever. It doesn't matter. That that automatically draws people to you. So it could be worth it if you play it right, you know? Oh, yeah. And I, I'm sure it's done well for you in that regard. And then in season, you did, did you only do season two? Is that all you did? Or did you do further than that? Or Yeah, so the first season of the challenge that I did was actually season 37. This show's been on forever, man. Gotcha. And then I just got finished filming over the summer, season 39. They just announced it about a week or two ago. And that'll start airing October 25th. Wow. So it's not out yet, but it's you all filmed. It. I got it. Yeah. Got it. Understood. Understood. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll talk about that after it comes out. Then we'll tackle that one after. And then we'll kind of revisit that and get into that experience. Oh, um, yeah. So... When we were talking before, you kind of talked about your schooling. I, I So I want to talk about what your kind of high school life and your college life and why you picked engineering. And then did you did you do any sports in high school? Were you interested in that or what were your interests in high school? And then what what brought you to the school you went to and what drew you to engineering? Because I'm curious, because that is a brainy 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 profession and you obviously have to be extremely skilled and intelligent so i'm curious i'd like to learn about that a little bit yeah i mean growing up i was always pretty damn smart i'm not yeah. gonna lie like all through grade school like i knew i kind of had it like every year we would have like our awards you know whatever like fourth fifth sixth eighth grade like smartest kid in the class and I was pretty damn smart growing up. So, <laughs> I don't doubt it, brother. I don't doubt it. Yeah. And I went off to high school. Um, I actually went to an all boys school. My mom had a lot of faith in me. She's like, we're going to send you to like this all boys, like college prep school. And I'm like, but all my friends are going to public school. That's where yeah, I'm going. Whoa. She's like, nope, you're already signed up. Like you're going. And I was like, oh. damn it. Anyway, no. I ended up going. It was a great school. I would do it again. I definitely would. Like, nice. very great school. Teachers were awesome. Like, just a very solid program all around. But, uh, yeah, during high school, that's when I really started figuring out, like, I'm a math and science guy. Like, I did sure. good in all of my subjects, but that was the one I enjoyed the most. I started taking all of, like, the, the AP college courses in yeah. high school. And physics was my favorite. I took a couple like AP physics classes, chemistry, yep. like just math, science, calculus. Like I was, that's my shit. So yeah. I did sports too. I was a big uh, martial arts guy. I started doing martial arts when I was like four years old. Nice. And I actually stopped that when I went off to college because in high school, I got really involved in track and field. I was a pole okay. vaulter. I actually wow. had the school record for the pole vault. Nice. Uh, I might still stand today. I got to check. I got to look in those record books. But uh, yeah, so pole vault was sick. That was like one of the funnest things you'll ever do. Just oh, it sounds like 15 feet in the air. Like, <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Fucking it's awesome. Goofy. Is it so, a rush? Oh, it's it's adrenaline. Yeah. you. Know, yeah. Everybody says like to be a pole vaulter, you got to like have a screw loose because it's like I've broken poles before, like going up and just snapping shit. You're falling, oh. like not even hitting the pit. Like, 
What what well, made you get into that? I mean, because that's a like a kind of an odder thing to get into, especially in high school. What drew you to that? Yeah, I started doing track actually like seventh or eighth grade. Yeah. Um, we had a little team, you know, like at the elementary school. So I started doing like the high jump, the long jump. I liked more of the field events. Yeah. And my dad was actually a pole vaulter back in high school. Makes and sense. And he would always tell me, he's like, oh, yeah, because they didn't have pole vault at the time. They only had it in high school. So okay. he's like, where do you get to high school? Like, you'll get to try pole vault. You might like it. Like, I loved it. So I was like, you know what? Let me try it. My dad liked it. I, I might like it. Day one, fell in love with it. I was like, That's this awesome. is my sport. Like, fuck everything else. So I, I ended it. up going to school at Cornell, both for pole vault, and I got accepted into the engineering program. That's just because I was a smart kid. So it was kind of like a double. Yeah. Cornell, man. That's... <laughs> If anybody, I'm sure most people know, but that's a really good school. Obviously, you got to be extremely smart to get in there. That that's a testament to to your work, man. So, um, with your math, especially, and I ask this because my dad started training me with math when I was in first grade, so I was always advanced. Clearly, you're far more advanced than me, but I'm a numbers guy too. And I think people that most people make math to be like it's the devil, you know, and it's so difficult. But if you love numbers. It's not so hard. So I guess my question is, my I want to compare it to kind of where I was just to show just how even more advanced you are. So I was in pre-calculus in eighth grade and geometry in ninth grade. So when I was in geometry, it was like all seniors, you know, and, yeah. and juniors, right? By the time I was a senior, I just stopped because I had done pre-calculus the year before. So I would have been on calculus. My assumption is you were probably trigonometry or even further than that in high school or am I... I don't know how your school went, but you sound like you're crazy advanced. Yeah, no, we only had up to calculus in high okay. school. Okay. Yeah. I mean, did you take things? Let me ask you this. When you get into college, especially at Cornell, how deep of math do you get into? Like the, the yeah. most advanced classes, because they got to be intense to be an engineer. Yeah, they have different levels of calculus, too. They make all the freshmen go through. There was, like, the Calc 2, Calc 3. It's, like, uh, multivariable calculus. Then you get into, brutal. like, differential equations, linear algebra. There, there's so many classes that you got to grind through those first, like, two, three years. And then you kind of get out of the math and you get more specific. And, yeah. you know, you get down to your major. But, yeah, a lot what of math. Did, what was your most difficult aspects or classes because i just remember like proofs in geometry and nobody could do them you know oh those sucked they were the worst <laughs> they were the worst so i wondered if that was <laughs> me those fucking sucked i'm like i thought this was math why am i like writing paragraphs over here about triangles like I don't yes know. yes what 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 was your most what was something that was easy for you that most people would find difficult and what was your most difficult for you yeah um like I said, I liked physics, okay. um, all types of physics. I mean, we had a bunch of different classes. Uh, I wasn't yeah. so much like a fan of like the, like we did electricity and magnetism, waves and optics, but I like more of the, the kinematics physics, you know, the stuff like if you throw a ball, like how far does it go? Give yeah. It a lot. Like that stuff I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, you know, definitely. What's the momentum of a car crash? If da, 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 like that, yeah. stuff. I like doing that stuff. Yeah. The one thing I hated was computer programming. I don't know if you ever Dude. heard of uh, MATLAB. Yes. Yes, uh, I have. I had, to, I had to take a MATLAB class, and it was so hard I had to take it twice. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that was the only one that got me. The second time around, I did a lot better, but yeah. I remember I thought for sure I want to do computer science when I was in high school, and um, I went up to orientation at University of Iowa and I was looking at the catalog for the classes and I told my mom she was sitting next to me I said I guess I'm switching majors you know like I was like <laughs> fuck this I don't want my whole school to just be math you know so when you're engineering it's really just like all math and physics isn't it pretty much and maybe some chemistry yeah. science and shit like that is it just that's pretty much cut and dry what it is yeah mostly math and physics so you're just straight dedicated to that knowingly going into it. So, yeah, you got to really love what you're doing to do that. That's fucking sweet. I'm assuming that for engineering, since that's such a 
like niche thing that that you that, that they probably the jobs are they difficult to find are there a lot of openings like talk talk me through that i'm curious into that field yeah i feel like engineering specifically i'm a mechanical engineer which is okay even a, it's a very broad field of engineering um yeah. like i feel like if you're an electrical engineer or a computer engineer like you're, you know you're doing the coding or you're doing you know very specific things where it's like mechanical engineer, you can be working on designing this water bottle. You could be designing an aircraft. You could be working on, you know, the hardware for a computer. It's like you can work on anything. The next toilet coming out, like <laughs> mechanical engineers are behind everything. So it's not so much like a very specific niche. It's like you can be in really any field as a nice. mechanical engineer. Like you can work on electronics. You can work at the chemical plant you can work. So like where other things are more niche, chemical engineer, electrical engineer, da, da, da. mechanical. I feel like there's a lot of jobs out there just because it's such a broad field. That is so cool, man. I I'm, I'm intrigued listening to all this. So I, I hope everybody <laughs> else is, this is, this is awesome. So let's kind of switch roles here. And I'm sure that a lot of my audience is going to want to hear about this. Cause you got some pretty fucking good size. Um, I'm wondering one, when you were in high school, college, what was what was your kind of stats, like your height, weight, and and have you always been, you know, looking like this? Or when did you get interested into weightlifting and maybe supplements, PEDs, if you have experience there? And what drew you to that? And let's kind of because I know that you do that some a lot of your videos now, that's what you're talking about, which is how I really looked into you the most to bring you on. Um, so let's I, I'm curious. Just start me from high school or whatever. And what got you into lifting to start with? Yeah, um, I guess it was kind of my martial arts background growing up. Um, you know, even when I was little, they had us doing, you know, push ups and strength and conditioning. So I kind of started doing that on my own just to kind of get better for myself. I was like, I want to yeah. be the best little martial artist there is. So I was in the basement doing like push ups and pull ups when I was 11, 12 years old. I got to high school, like I said, I started doing track, and I was a pole vaulter, but on some of, like, the workouts, they would make us, like, run, and I yeah. would, like, sneak away from the runs and go <laughs> in the weight room with the throwers, because they were always lifting, and I'm like, I want to lift weights and get big, I don't need all this running, like, I want to be a pole vaulter, but, like, a jacked, good-looking pole vaulter, right? Right. So, I would go and start sneaking in lifts, and, you know, that's really where I started to... I mean, not get into bodybuilding, but more just like strength training, you know, um, was in high school track, sneaking away with the throwers, getting the lifts in. Yeah. Uh, then I went off to college. They still were trying to hold us back from the lifts. They're like, you can't get too big. I mean, I was always skinny growing up. I think when I started high school, I was maybe a buck 30. Oh, shit. 100, yeah. 130, 135 pounds. Wow. By the time I got to college. I think I put a little size on. I was maybe 155, 160. How tall are you? I'm 5'8". Okay, well, that that makes more sense then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, in college, I was about 160, 165 pounds. Now I'm like 195, 200. Yeah, so yeah. And I've you put got on a lot of weights. Yeah, I've put on a lot of weight since then. But actually, in college, my junior year uh, pole vaulting, I had a real bad knee injury that kind of put me out of pole vaulting. Okay. So I was like, all right, well, now I can't do pole vault anymore. I mean, like I could have, I probably would have recovered in, you know, four or five months and I would have been back at it. But during that time I was on crutches, crutching into the gym, hitting the upper body while I could. I was like, you know right. what? I'm going to get these weights going. Uh, when the legs, you know, are back to normal, I'll start hitting the legs again. But that's when I really was like, you know what? I'm just full blown weightlifter now. Yeah. So my junior, senior year, I started getting a lot more serious into the the bodybuilding, the supplements. I want to say it was my junior year of college is when I really started my my research, where I got to going on SARMs and steroids and all different kinds of supplements and tropics. So you name it, I was like, I'm going to research every damn supplement out there, see which ones are worth taking. And I think, God, I must have been what. 19, 20 at the time. How old are you when you're a junior? Maybe 21-ish. Yeah. 2021. 
Um, so I'm looking into like SARMs and I think that's when I started coming across some of your stuff. Yeah. I was on like the forums reading about SARMs and I remembered your name. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I've definitely seen this guy before. So yeah, a lot of the stuff that I was looking up, I'm like, he's been there, done it. So you must oh, have yeah. been in the game for a while now. Bro, I, I'll tell you what, when I started, um, the only SARMs that were available when I started were MK2866, S4, and MK677, and barely anybody, well, I should say barely anybody, there was barely anybody selling them, but MK677 was only on a couple sites, and it was like 250 bucks a fucking bottle. Whoa! Literally. <laughs> yeah. Well, back then, from and I talked to, because I, I'm a researcher by nature, so I want to meet, I want to understand, and from the owners that I talked to, apparently the raw materials were like triple what they are now to, to produce it. So that's why it was so expensive, but there were minimal options. And I dedicated years and years and years to studying SARMs. And I was ahead of the game on everything. I knew what was coming out beforehand. I had all the studies because a lot of the, the websites were putting out bad information that they didn't have properly to sell them. And I was ahead of the game. So that's how I got into it. But, um, what what so let's see if you were 19 20 and you're 27 now so you were like 2015 or 16 when you got into it then right with sarms and yeah steroids. seven eight years ago ish what what made you start to look into those was it because i'm assuming at that time that's when they started to boom where more people were selling them because pro hormones had been banned so they were more prevalently sold as like capsules and supplements that they shouldn't have been right is that what drew you to them or yeah, I think it was at that point, you know, I was getting more serious in the lifting. Yeah. Um, I was getting bigger, but I'm like, I don't think I can get much bigger than I am now. Like, I feel like I can try and put on weight, but I just noticed I was like, if I did put on weight, I would just get fat. Or, you know, if I, I wanted you. to cut down, I would just get skinny. Right. I'm like, I want to be big, jacked, shredded. Like, I want the size. I want to be lean. I'm like, my body can only do so much. So I started seeing what supplements would help, you know, what's going to work. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, I've been doing the creatine. I was like, all right, I think I'm ready for a step up. Right. So I started doing my research and I didn't try my first arm actually till I think 24. I think 24 was when I did my first arm. Okay. Uh, so from the time I was about 20 to 24, I, I researched the shit for years. Good. before ever touching it because i knew i'm like all right this stuff is kind of going to be like a, a lifelong commitment once you start dabbling in it you go from the SARMs, then the steroids you, i knew i'm like all right if i'm going to do it i want to do it safe i want to have all of the information i want to know which ones are good what's the side effects of everything what do i have to take to you know complement uh the the storm that i'm taking to combat the side effects that i'm going to get from it so yes i did shit tons of research on every ancillary, every SARM, every steroid. And then when I was like 24 ish, I was like, okay, I'm about that time. My mid twenties, my brain's getting it at that point where I'm fully developed. My body's like done growing now. Now I can start fucking with my endocrine. System. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to point this out to people listening and people that follow me know that what he just said is like what I preach constantly about, years of studying it and and it sounds ridiculous it does on the surface but you get it and you understand and obviously that's a testament to you having all the schooling and understanding what things take but you cannot do this and rush into it and that's how all the mistakes are made and that's how people hurt so i just want to point that out that you really did things in a way that I preach that I personally, and some people don't like me for that, but it's, it's the fact of life that you got to protect yourself. And so I'm so glad that you said all of that. Now, let me ask you this. Um, have you kept up on your blood panels and um, do you check up on them and make sure that everything's in check and in line? Cause some people are like, Oh, people don't do that. Or you don't need to do that. And I just want, I'm curious what your thoughts are and how you've done with that. Yeah, so I started off actually doing it myself uh, through, I don't know if you heard, Let's Get Checked. It's uh, like they send you the kit. In the <laughs> They sponsored me for, they still do, actually. That's one of my sponsors. So, yeah, I'm well aware of that. Boom. There you go. 
So I started off doing that. I would get my blood work checked, you know, before, after, just Good. to make sure I'm not screwing anything up. Good. And uh, after my first couple SARM uh, cycles of doing that, I did it on my own. And then I went to my doctor. I was like, all right, doc, like, I'm starting to take some supplements. Like, I've been keeping up with my blood work as best I can on my own. You know, I'm checking it. But I want a more comprehensive panel. I'm like, I want to get blood work. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm starting to take this stuff. And I know it affects people in different ways. So I just want to see a complete panel. Yeah. And my doctor at the time was like, you look good. You look healthy. We don't need to do blood work. So at that moment, I switched doctors. Yeah. Got a new doctor. My new doctor is great. Uh, I've been going and getting blood work every couple months, checking in, seeing where I'm at, donating blood. That's another thing you got to do when you start taking the steroids, especially when you're on like TRT or something, or even just big doses of steroids, your blood's going to thicken up. So I always like to do that. Blood work, donating blood. You got to really poke yourself a lot when you start getting into this, which people don't realize. It's yeah. like, oh, you think you do a couple injections and that's it and you get all big and strong. But it's like, no, nah, you become kind of like a little pin cushion. It, and, it, and you know what? It, it as you the, the problem is, is like guys your age, you guys especially, your blood work tends to look really good. You know what I mean? And, and it's going to stay that way. But some people don't realize that longer term, this stuff adds up and accumulates and it doesn't continue to look good. And you don't realize how it's going to look in 10 years. And you have to keep eyes on things that more so than just a CMP, which is the, the comprehensive metabolic panels, right? You have to look at everything yeah. and you have to look at full lipid profiles, for example, because there's different aspects of, of cholesterol that you have to look at that are misunderstood. So there's a lot to it that you have to keep an eye on, especially with steroids. You should be doing it with SARMs, peptides, nootropics, all, even though that it's far less of a, a thrashing of your system. It, it, sometimes people get fake SARMs, spike SARMs. You got to keep an eye on that for your own well-being. So um, what what SARMs did you run first and which ones have you had the best and worst experiences with so far? Oh, let's see. Which SARMs have I done? I've done, I think my first one was LGD. Okay. I skipped the MK. I went okay, right to LGD. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I've done LGD, RAD140, um, I've done MK677 and Carterine. They're not SARMs, but they lump them in. Yep, yep. Um, I've tried S23. That's like the big daddy. Uh, what did you think uh, of S23? And and um, are you on TRT or did you run a PCT with that? Because I think people don't understand S23. is uh, It's termed male contraceptive because it fucking – Derange your test down to nothing and yep. bottoms it out like a steroid. So what 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 did you go through with it? Yeah, so I was taking tests while I did S23. Okay. Good. 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 Yep. How did you like yeah, S23? After all, <laughs> after all the research I read on S23, I was like, all right, I'm not touching that unless I'm doing tests. Yeah. So I think it was actually my second test cycle. My first cycle of tests, I just did tests. Smart. The second smart. time around, I was like, all right, now I'm going to add in a second compound. That was S23. Okay, good, good. What was your experience like with S23? Definitely got very full, vascular. Um, the strength was up, but like I just noticed I was looking like dry, yeah. veins popping, muscles were round, more so than just test alone. I was like, all right, this is a big difference. I can yeah. definitely see that just the the look. Like I wasn't competing or anything, but I was like, I feel like I could step on a bodybuilding stage right yeah. now. Well, and people listening, this is just goes to show you what I've said a million times is that people people will say this, and you can testament to this because you've done it now. When you run SARMs with steroids or tests, they don't fucking cancel each other out. And one doesn't counteract the other one. That's not how it works. And that's like a mythical bro science thing. And you know firsthand by doing it, the difference between oh, yeah. just test and then test with S23. So yeah. there's a lot of people that think, oh, they're going to compete for the same androgen uh, receptors and I'm going to get less out of the test. But fuck. taking S23 with test, it was, it was a step up. If I didn't love my fucking hair so much, I'd pull it out from that nonsense, from hearing that bullshit. <laughs> I got to tell you, man. Um, so, we, and you went straight to LGD4033 because obviously 3303 wasn't out at the time we're talking. So, 
Yeah. What? What? Because I can tell you, I ran two eight six six and S four was my first SARM cycle because that's all I. That was my only options, and yeah. that's what made me so intrigued with them because I, I'm very vascular anyway because of all the cardio I do and I'm super lean and I, I don't do cycles anymore, which is why I've lost size and I I'm a cardio guy now. I still lift, but um, at that time I had kind of bulked up a little bit for me. And I ran that shit and I was like, what the fuck? You know, like, yeah. holy shit. And it's like the side effects are very minimal. I got the vision with the S4, you know, at the time, but it didn't really bother me that much. But it was like, whoa, you know, but I, and I got strong, but I didn't, I felt good, you know, like really good. So with LGD, especially your first time and that being your first cycle, I'm sure you responded like, whoa, you know with it what what did you get from it what did you feel like on it and obviously the experience must have been good because it made you want to run more SARM so tell me about that yeah so I remember my first cycle uh I was taking five milligrams okay. of LGD a day okay. so I mean not crazy high no. not like you know nothing like some people are taking 10 20 30 40 I even heard like just ridiculous numbers I was like, I'm going to start with five. Right. And I think I did that. It was either six or eight weeks. You know, not a crazy, crazy cycle. No. But I got way more than I was actually expecting from it. Cool. All of the reviews on it, everybody was like, oh, you know, with LGD, you're going to get kind of big and you might hold some water and get puffy. It's a great bulker. And after like a couple of days, I was like, my veins are popping out. Yeah. Like I got striations. I'm like, I don't think I'm holding a bunch of like nonsense water on me. Like I'm looking good. Yes. Like looking cut up. Everybody's like, oh, you're going to get big and fat kind of looking, uh, taking it. And I was like, that is not the case. No. Five milligrams a day. And I was like, wow, this is not creatine. This is a whole nother league. No. And that, you know, that bothers me because LGD does not convert to estrogen. Um, no. and, and I think, and I assume that a lot of people get water from it because they think it, because it's bulking, it's their diet, not so much the compound itself. Um, it, it, it doesn't hold water. So I'm lost. And, and it also brings into question the quality of the LGD that you're getting. Now I know that 3303 is a drier compound, so to speak, and it can get you stronger and bigger, but 4033 is extremely strong. So I struggle with the people that preach that it holds water and you obviously ran it. And how was your diet when you ran it? Um, I think back then when I first really started trying, you know, my first SARMs, I was like chicken and rice and that's it. Right. <laughs> so I was actually, I, I had a pretty good diet. Now I, I, you know, not to say I eat like, like shit, but I do eat things I like. Right. But you can do it with a balance. Like, I don't need to just eat chicken and rice. Sure. I'm like, you know, I can have things I like. I mean, I eat a lot of other things. Greek yogurt. Yeah. Uh, I like my protein pancakes. I even like pasta, you know, shit like that. You can eat it. You don't need to be just a chicken and rice guy. But at the time when I was taking LGD, I was a chicken and rice guy. Right. You know, I was like, my diet's got to be locked in. I took it very seriously. Good. As you should. You yep. should take this stuff very seriously. How was your um how was your testosterone suppression when you took LGD because you did take not really what I would call a full dose but you took enough to get the results no no I don't I don't advise ever going over 10 milligrams of LGD uh 4033 a lot of times 3303 is ran at 20 which I don't have a problem with so to speak but I I max my recommendations out at 10 so you even went a fraction of that so what was your any side effects and what was your um, testosterone number after you ran it suppression wise? Um, I didn't have any side effects. I think actually when I did LGD for the first time, I noticed I was a little more thirsty than usual. Okay. I think uh, some people get that. Some people don't. But yep. I was just like, my throat's dry. Right. I need more water. Yep. That was the only thing I noticed, you know. Some people get weird side effects. They feel off. They feel goofy. Um, I've even heard people saying like, oh, I think I got gyno from LGD. And I'm like, listen, I got nothing except feeling thirsty. Right. And 
My suppression wise, I did my LGD cycle and then just like an over the counter, like generic PCT they sell at the, the supplement store. No uh, Clomid, no Nova, no HCG. I wasn't getting into any of that back then. Right. Now, you know. Obviously, yeah. There's time and place for those drugs, definitely. Right, but for sure. Back then, um, just some over the counter PCT from the supplement store. And before and after, I think I did my blood work probably a couple weeks after my PCT. I did, you know, your three or four week PCT, taking a couple of those little pills a day. And my test was right back. Yeah. So not a huge suppression, if if any. And then I guess the PCT must have worked. Sure. But a few weeks after, it was right back. So. And because you ran a fraction of the, not a fraction, but kind of like a half of a full dose and a lot of times younger guys, their test bounces back a lot faster and um, you'll notice you're good. And you'll notice as you get older that it, it and ran more cycles, it's a lot more difficult to get your test to come back. Um, that testosterone uh, or the PCT, I'm sorry, that you used, uh, do you remember what was, did you look and see what, what was in that uh, you used? Oh shit. Um and that you may not remember that far back. I don't even remember. I was just at the supplement store. The guy was like, if you're gonna try SARMs, take this PCT oh, after. And I was like, all right. <laughs> not the supplement store guy. Oh <laughs> I'm just glad you made it out okay with that. I I the, the supplement store guy that that needs to be avoided at all costs. But I I know, yeah, that that wasn't, I mean it's okay, bro. I mean, fuck, <laughs> I've done some of the stupidest shit that I knew better than doing. I mean, th we all do it. That's how we learn. And that's how we, the best teachers have made the most mistakes, right? That's why yeah. I'm a good teacher. Cause I've made so many fucking mistakes and I can admit that, you know, but that's how you help people is by explaining what you did good and what you did wrong. Right. So, uh, do you have any peptide and nootropic experiences that you want to talk about? Um, the peptides I haven't gotten into yet, but I'm yeah. starting to, you know, think about, um, employing some of them. Yeah. Uh, just off the rip, I think BP one, BPC one five seven and TB 500 are going to be the first ones that I try just because I hear great things, a lot of good healing properties from them. And yes. not that I'm old, but it's like. I want to like be healthy. I want to make sure my joints don't go on me. I want to make sure like this engine is firing as it should so that I can just get my lifts in, like hit it hard and not have to worry about injury. Yes. So yeah, I haven't tried any of the peptides yet, but I'm kind of excited to. So the two that you mentioned are life-saving for a lot of people. And I can say firsthand with certainty, especially that first time I ran TB 500, I was like, whoa, the shit is the real deal. And it really is. And it does help you to avoid having to use HGH for your healing. And these are specifically, you know, made for healing purposes. It's not like HGH that is, is multifaceted. These are direct, you know, directly involved in healing. And one of the things that I recommend with a uh, SARMs and peptide healing stack is uh, the two that you mentioned, the TB and the BPC with MK677, MK2866. And although LGD4033 isn't like a primary on healing, it has some secondary benefits and it fits in nicely because then it adds in some other obviously strength size. So if you don't want to do that, fine, but it's a great addition to the healing stack. But that's a great stack. What a couple of, that are good to start with for um, peptides, depending on your goals. Ipamorelin and CG, uh, CJC twelve ninety five, and yep. then if you're looking to cut, um, HGH fragment is a good one to start with. Now there's new ones out there, but some of them, you know, semaglutide, you know, um, AOD, th those can have some side effects. You may not want to deal with tezofenzine, but they do work. But there's a there's so many fucking options and different things peptides do. I mean, as you know, but those are good ones to start with. You may want to look at, you know, for the future. The ipamorelin and CJC are great ways to start. So I, I think you'd benefit greatly from those. And, you know, I'd be intrigued to hear your experiences after you use them for sure. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned the uh, semaglutide. I think that's really taking Hollywood by storm oh, right man. now. 
So much so that all of like my aunts and uncles have started taking it. They're like, we got to lose weight. We're taking semaglutide. I'm like, oh, is that big? Like the diabetes medication? Yeah. Like, you're taking this? They're like, yeah. I'm like, but you don't have diabetes. <laughs> like, you might want to not do that. And that's why I'd always tell people, please, like, read into some of these because some of them, it's not that they don't work. You know what I mean? That That's not it. But you need to understand, like, I'm very much against clenbuterol, right, for example, because I know the damage it does. And it's like, this is a fucking asthma medication, and it's used in very small doses, and you're using it this way and don't understand the implications. Or even Clomid and Novadex, you know, one being a fertility drug and one being a treatment for breast cancer. Do you think that you should stay on those for extended periods of times or use them when you don't need them? You know, it's shit like that that people... Think about it. When you're doing TRT, it's like it serves a purpose as long as you're using it right, you know? Yeah. So I just hope people fucking consider that shit. But when did you what, – when, what age were you when you ran your first testosterone cycle? And kind of walk me through – I know you said you did test only first, which I love. That's always my recommendation because if you do multiple compounds you don't know how they're affecting you and what your tolerances are and then you learn if you're estrogen prone or not with test and how your body's responded to outside stimulus so i know you said you did test and i think test s23 was your second walk me through what when you started and what your experience is like so far yeah so it was probably all right, so if I started my SORMs, I think I started, yeah, like I said, my first SORM was right around 24, and then I think 25-ish was my first steroid cycle. Okay. So I did, uh, you know, my test E for 10 weeks, and then I took nine months off. And then I went, did my second cycle, my test, and my S23 took nine months off, you know? Smart. So I did, like, the one a year, and then uh, about – what is it? September now. So probably five, six months. I think back in April, I started on like a, a TRT regimen, which I started off doing 200 milligrams of testosterone in a week. Okay. After a couple months, I got my blood work checked and the numbers were just through the roof. So I backed it down to 150 a week. Right. So yeah, lately I've been at 150 milligrams of testosterone a week. Actually, just last week, I'm starting to slowly up the dose now. I'm going to do a little cycle yeah. uh, test, throwing some Primo and a little bit of Animar too. Okay. So Pr Primo Bolin's my favorite compound. Um, I, I've talked about this for years and years and years. And test Primo Anabar really is my favorite cycle. So I think you're going to absolutely love that as long as you've got, you know, quality Prima Bowl and there's a lot of fakes out there, which I'm sure you're aware of, and I'm sure you've covered your bases on that, but um, that's when you're going to love and you're going to really find that although it's not prominently profound, like a Anadrol or a D ball where you're just getting smacked with gains, this is slow gains where you can consistently see it in the mirror. If you're not too overly big, right? Because a lot of bigger guys yeah. don't like Prima Bowling because they can't see and understand what it's doing. But when you can get that and mix it with Anivar, as long as you're not running stupid doses, you're going to fucking love it. I guarantee it. Yeah, And it's going to look really good on you because it's going to cut you up and you're going to feel good. Because one of the things that I say, and I'm assuming you've always felt pretty good on yours, is what's the point in running a cycle if it's full of side effects and you feel like shit? You can't really enjoy yeah. it. So actually I did try kind of this cycle before, um, back, I think I finished that up in January. So this was like over the winter time. Uh, I did tests. I did some Primo, but I only went up to 300 milligrams. Okay. So not much Primo. And then I did Anivar on my lifting days for about a six week period, but small amounts of Anivar too. Um, gosh, I don't even think I went up to. 25 milligrams okay. it was like 20 milligrams of animal yeah kept it light that's good yeah there's nothing wrong with that man because it's this is a marathon it's not a sprint and there's no reason to dive head first in and just go for craziness it's i always tell people like if you're learning to play basketball do you start shooting fucking three pointers or do you start your and work your way out you know what i mean yeah i mean and it's and i could make analogy after analogy after analogy it's like People that want to run trend on a first cycle, I just, I, 
Ooh. I don't fucking understand what, yeah, where this is upstairs. I mean, I get it because everything in life is instant gratification, but that that's not how this works. That will bite you in the fucking ass. You know, I've had so many buddies that I guess they think trend is like the only steroid out there. Oh. They don't really know anything about it. So they'll come to me. They're like, you know, Ed, I'm thinking of uh, hopping on some trends soon. You think that's a good idea? Uh. I'm like, are you fucking stupid? Like, what are you? And they're like, yeah, I think I'm going to start lifting. I'm going to take some trend. I'm like, you're an idiot. <laughs> I made a video. Uh, it's been about a month or two now, and it's called. The best way to use Tran is to not use it at all. And and this is coming from a guy that had, I could show you like eight pack stacks when I was running Tran. And I mean the results, but when I start to explaining to people what went along with that and how I felt, and it was like some of the worst I've ever felt. It's like, is it worth it? You know, for, for yeah. the picture, is it really worth it? And the answer is fuck no. You know, it's not. The horror stories I've heard, I think trans one, I'm never going to touch. I, I, I say that and I think I really will probably never touch that. Um, the, the horror stories you hear, just people feeling like shit. Like that's, that's where like the roid rage comes from. The trend people are like, I can't sleep. I'm just sweating all night. Yes. I broke up with my girlfriend. Now I like guys. Uh, this, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, they're like, yeah, trend really messed me up. I was like, I can see. Like <laughs> that, that one threw me for a loop right there. No offense, but to anybody out there, but that threw me for a fucking loop. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. I will tell you this. This is just for me personally. And and this is so you're aware and, and everybody else is aware. The part that was the worst for me, because I'm a guy that's like fully in control of my emotions and my mind is the way that it affected me emotionally to have something do that to where a guy like me that, that it, it, you got to come with me with something fucking drastic for me to be emotionally off the way that made me feel. I never, ever, if you paid me a million dollars, I wouldn't want to feel that way again. You know what I'm saying? And, and everybody's different, but um, if you're somebody that is overly aggressive or has any kind of emotional problems or uh, depression or anything like that, please don't go near Tran or Halotestin, please. Or yeah. a really super draw because of how that can make you feel too. But those two especially, oh my gosh, bro, like, whoo. And, and I'm so glad you have the outlook you do because it's it, there's no reason to really use it, to be honest with you. No, yeah, and the mental side effects, the, the depression, the anxiety, yes. like, you're either pissed off at the world, or, like, you're crying, like, I mean, these are just stories people tell me, Yeah, haven't tried it myself, that's been a rule of mine, I stay away from the Nandrolums, and I think every, like, new lifter getting into this stuff, uh, well, just for me personally, too, because I want to have kids someday, the Nandrolone HPTA suppression is way beyond anything you're going to get with like testosterone or a DHT derivative. I'm like, if you want to be shut down for months and months and maybe even years, yeah, go ahead. Try your trend, try your DECA, try that stuff out. But like, I think there's a time and place for it. I think it's later in life. I think, you know, is when you want to employ something like that. But at least for me right now, I think the Nandrolones just aren't worth it. Trying to plan a family soon. And no, it, it's, you're totally right now. I've ran DECA and I've ran TREN both. And I did DECA. The best experience I had with DECA, and this is something I don't generally advise, was I just ran it with my TRT, um, like as TRT, like 100, 200 milligrams with it. And I ran it for yep. longer than I like, 14, 16 weeks, which is okay, I guess. But man, it, it was a good experience because I was extremely dry. I felt really good on it. But that that's when you start running it higher, it can be really problematic, even at just like 400 milligrams. And especially when you run it with trend and I've seen people do it with trend just fine. And I've pe seen people run it solo, but I'm telling you, man, if you have a bad experience with it, like, and, and what you're talking is all fact, it can fuck you up, like fuck yeah. up bad. And uh, I don't know about you, but there's nothing worse than a libido side effect in my world. Like that's like the worst debilitating thing. And that he did it to me. And I was like, fuck this. I've never run either one of these again. And I haven't since that I have not.
Yeah, how is that for you? Because I know there's the notorious Deca dick that everybody loves to talk about. Dude, to me, because it's never been a problem for me, so when it is, I feel like my whole world's fucked up because it's it gets into your head too. And when it gets into your head, it just makes the libido issue worse. And when you've gone through before, that's never really been a problem. And then it is. And it's like, my wife even asked me, is, is it me? Is something wrong? And then I feel even worse. And then I start thinking about it even more. And I'm like, no, it's not. But, and, and, da, 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 and it's like, no, never again. I don't, I don't ever want that fucking feeling again, dude, like never. So I think you have a really smart outlook. And this is a testament to you because you're a research type of guy that you dot jumped into things blindly. And I love that about you, man. Like, and that's why I would encourage people to listen to you because I am funny about recommending who to listen to. And that's nothing against, cause there's a lot of guys that I really like personally, but I disagree with the way that they, you know, preach their stuff and that's fine. You know, just, that's the way of life. But I like your outlook a lot, bro. Like I didn't know all of this about you and I fucking love it. And I certainly would endorse people to listen to you because it's awesome that you, you do that. How do you kind of convey your messages to, to people that are watching you and what are some things that you tend to focus on and, and kind of preach? Yeah, me, I'm a big number yeah. guy. So I like to look at numbers. Uh, most of the time when I post a video, uh, it's just coming at you with like, Cold hard Good. facts, whether it's like, you know, uh, dosage, length of time, uh, how much you should do, or if it's like something in calories, how many calories you should eat or changing your diet, like with this, this, and this will do this to the numbers. Like I'm a very number oriented guy, but like very simple. I think I can break things down in a way that people understand. Whereas like sometimes you watch like a, a Derek more plates, more dates episode and he's just like, well, exogenous administration of testosterone can have deleterious effects on it. And you, you lose people because he's like, well, that jargon is like next level. Like people can't understand yeah. it. I feel like I just I'm very simple in the words that I use. And I use a lot of numbers where people are like, oh, wow, that makes sense. If I eat this many calories if I take this amount for this long, this is what my level will be. You yes. know? So I think I have a very kind of easy to listen to, uh, if you will, style to my videos. That's awesome. I don't, I don't give too much information, uh, you know, with the, the deep, deep medical dives, but I tell you how things work in your body and then break it down with the numbers and really just drive the point. And, home. you know, and I, not Derek's obviously super intelligent. I don't think anybody's going to. He's a yeah. genius. That dude. Yeah. yeah. So this is level. nothing against him for anybody watching because we all think, I don't know anybody that doesn't think he's fucking intelligent, but sometimes for a lot of people, it turns them off because they don't understand or it's, it, he, he doesn't talk down to people, but it can feel like that when you start doing that. You know what I mean? Like, like, and I don't get this from him, but I understand a newbie could be like, oh, he, he's kind of talking down or thinks he's superior, which I don't think he does, but you could, you could get that. So I don't want to call it dumbing it down because that's not it. It's more like speaking it more plainly or um, making it simplistic without making it too difficult to understand with scientific terminologies, you know, so to speak. And yeah. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Derek's the oh, legend, yeah. man. The, the information that he puts out is next yeah. level. But some of my buddies will listen to it. I'll be like, oh, you got to check this guy out. Like, look at look at this video. And they're like, man, I didn't understand yeah. any of that. And I'm like, all right, all right. And I would say <laughs> let me make it he's really good for more advanced people that really grasp it, that need more yeah. understanding. And that's cool. Everybody's got their own preferences. And, and, and some people want deep dives. But I think the majority of the people, it's a lot easier when you're first learning to get it broken down kind of kind of easier or more rational i guess so to speak and not as big a terminologies until you you have to learn a lingo when it comes to peds because there's clearly a different lingo for things and different terminologies and short short phrases i mean even pct if you don't i mean you got to start with simple stuff to learn and understand it right and so oh yeah it, it, it needs to be broken down and explained and, and I think the way that you do it is really awesome. So that's cool, man. Um, 
what what has been your best and worst experiences so far with PEDs use and what's some of the craziest shit you've been asked? Hmm. Let me think. What would be my worst experience? Hopefully you haven't had anything too terrible. I yeah, I feel like not on wood. I really haven't had like a bad experience. I know people like they'll have reviews where it's like, this was my cycle from hell that I'll never do again. But for me, I can't really pinpoint like one where I was like, I'll never do that again. Like that was awful. Like thankfully up until this point, everything has been pretty smooth sailing and every cycle that I've ever ran, I've been like, wow, I got some great benefits out of that. I felt good. But you, you've been a little so bit, I'm hoping to keep you've that been forward. a little bit more conservative with what you've done, which is smart. And I don't, have you ran anything crazy yet or anything? I mean, what's the, what would you say is the strongest thing you've ran SARMs wise, probably S 23, I assume, but what about steroid wise? Yeah, storms wise, definitely S23. Steroid wise, the only ones I've ran so far, test three okay. one and all right. Well, I haven't even bothered with the other ones just because I feel like to build a good physique, you don't really need the no, other a ones. A little bit goes a long, long way. It really does. What what is like I have a lot of buddies that are just like, oh, I'm gonna load with D ball and then I'm gonna add my DECA in and then trend for the second half of my cycle and then I'm gonna cut <sighs> with the winstraw. And I'm like, oh my God, dude, like are you okay? Like I look better than you and you're on like fucking three grams of gear and I'm sitting over here on like four hundred tests, three hundred yes. like <laughs> I think you could be okay. So what I've gathered and just from my personal, it's like you start looking at, oh my gosh, this does this and this does this and this does this. But what you don't realize is like you can't even see what's doing what. At you just assume and like you'll start thinking in your head, oh, it's gotta be this that's doing that because that's what it's supposed to do. But you never really learn what something's doing when you start blasting seven and eight different fucking things, you know, and, and you don't yeah. give yourself the chance to even truly learn about them. You're just going on assumption from what you read. And what people tell you, but everybody's different, man, like how they respond. And I think people need to be aware of that. Is there something that you haven't ran yet that you're looking at going, okay, I think like, so I'm assuming for you, like something that may be intriguing is maybe like a master on or a wind straw or maybe like a T ball or something like that. Is there anything you're looking at that in the future that you're going to plan on doing or trying or. Yeah, maybe a master on. I definitely would try that. Um, and then further on down the road, I do want to try NPP. Okay. I've had my eye on NPP for a while, but I don't want to try it just yeah. yet. Um, but I heard a lot of good stuff about that one. And I'm kind of excited, you know. I do want to try that at some point. I, I would just, um, I, I would tell that, you with NPP, if you're going to do it, don't go crazy on the dose. And, and a lot of times with, uh, you know, a DECA or NPP, people are so concerned about, Oh, should I run test way higher? Should I run it way higher? There's no correct answer to that because everybody's different. What I've always kind of stood by is keeping the doses equal or very close test, maybe just a slight bit higher, but NPP being a short yep. ester, you know, something to maybe look at is test prop and NPP six to eight weeks, 7,500 milligrams every other day. There's really no need to go any higher than that. I mean, in all reality, and you can kind of get a gauge on your prolactin response, your estrogen response, how they kind of coincide and how they work together. And you, you'll see some fucking pretty sweet results, especially on your frame with it. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people goof up too. I like that you mentioned that the ratio, you said you keep it about one yeah. to one or maybe a little bit higher because you hear stories where people are like, oh, I'm going to just run my TRT dose, 100, 150 uh, of test. And then they're like, I'm going to do 700 oh. of DECA. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, it's got nightmare written all over it, man. Seriously. I mean, like, I feel like for every, like, one out of, you know, 100,000 people, that might work. But for the most part, you're like, oh, dude, you're just asking for yes, side effects. Yes, it's true, man. I fucking love the way that you, uh, your beliefs are on this. I really do, man. It's It's a breath of fresh air for me. Um, and, and as you, as you build your YouTube, you're going to see that there's bros that will come at you for being more conservative, but you're going to get a big following of people that love you for it. And that's part of this. So I kind of want you to know, um, what you'll kind of get. I, I just, at this point, I've done this so long. My skin is so thick. I could give a shit really what it, and most people are pretty cool at this <laughs> point now, but you'll go through that. But just, 
disregard it and just always tell them, hey, you know, I appreciate the fact that you got a different opinion. That's not my belief. And hey, maybe my channel is not for you. It's cool. But if it is, thanks for stopping by, you know. Dude, and the thing is, especially nowadays, you see so many bodybuilders that are dropping dead at a young age and you're like, oh, my God, what the heck's yeah. happening? It's like this is a problem. Like it's a big problem. Yeah. So like my message that I preach is like, keep it simple. Don't go crazy. Nothing over the top. You really don't need it. You can look great doing the basic things at a moderate dosage. And with all the kids out there on TikTok uh. and Instagram, like. Uh, dude, everybody's just smacking drugs all over the place. Let me try this. Let me try that. And I'm like, all right, you can right. do it. But if you're going to do it, do it safe. Do your research. Don't just start taking shit because like your buddy told you this is a good idea. Like it, <laughs> there's so many kids that are like, oh, man, I want to try this or I'm going to try that. I'm like, did you research it for a couple years first? And they're like, well, no, but. I'm like, do your research. Buddy. And that's the thing about social media. It, I, I'm not going to be one of those douchebags that's like, oh, social media ruined the world and all that. Because there's a lot of stuff on there that's helped me and has helped you. And, you know, there's good oh, ways yeah. to unit, use it. But there's a lot of fucking bad that comes from it, too. And so all I can say with that is, is to just be careful when something sounds over the top or it's like somebody super young or just like careless. Use your fucking head, you know. If you think something sounds off, it probably is, you know, like, and, and I get it. You see somebody that looks huge or like has big results, but there's a lot of guys that looked huge with big results that are either fucking dead or end up with some serious problems that you just don't hear about yeah. anymore. You know, they just disappear or fall off. And the thing is too, as long as you got like a solid workout routine in place, you got your diet down you're going to look good taking a little bit of gear. There's some guys I talk to in the gym and you'd be surprised the amount of people that just take all these crazy drugs and they don't even look exactly. like it at all. I'm like, you're on this much of that, that, and that. Like I would have never guessed dude. Like, and you know what part of the problem is, bro? It's like a lot of people have this misconception that the gear is going to do all the work for you and that you're it, it, look, yeah. A lot of these monsters, one, they have genetics that none of us could ever fathom having. Two, yeah. these guys live the most regimented lives. They're pretty miserable with their diets, you know, and they are animals with their training consistency. And they are on fucking point with everything. Like, you don't just get results by just taking shit. You have to have everything dialed in. I mean... You can yep. get away with some things like on trend, for example. And I think that's part of the intrigue too, is the nutrient partitioning and things, but you have to be dialed in or it, this shit does not work. Like you think. Yeah. At all. So, I mean, it's, it's cool though, that I see like you are not new to this, but you're newer, but you're so your, your mindset is so good. Like it really, really is. And, and what I love about somebody like you, that's a little bit younger is that you're going to help a lot of younger guys that are going to be looking at you too. Because while I'm a very cool older guy, not that I'm fucking old, but as you start to get my age at 40, 41, it's like some people think you're a teacher and I don't come across like that, like a douchebag, but with you being younger and having the mindset and the personality you do, I really want to stress people to check Ed out because he's really, really, really onto something here. And he's definitely somebody that, I would be fully confident that you listen to moving forward. And I think you're going to do great, man. I really have full confidence in that. I appreciate it. Yeah. I think that's definitely where uh, my message is kind of aimed at. It's more of the, the younger yes. guys that, you know, they're going to do it. You can't stop them from doing it, but teach them the right way yeah. to do it. Um, so like, um, I'm not out here training guys for a bodybuilding competition that have been, you know, lifting for 20 years. That's, that's not what I'm putting out. My content that I'm putting out is for guys that are first starting to step into the storms, the first couple steroid cycles, they're trying to figure out how to plan it, what to do, what to run with it, how long. To, so it's all of just like when you're starting to dip your toes in the water and you want to do it the safe way, that's kind of where my videos are aimed yes. at. I love it, bro. I really do. It's been Awesome talking to you. I, I hope that I can have you on for a part two. And especially 
it will be cool after the next season on MTV comes out. So we can kind of talk about that. And then if you've ran anything new, we can talk about that and some, some more, I, I think the PED side of this is going to be really intriguing to people too, on top of learning about you. And now that we've learned about you. So guys, I fully, fully encourage you, which I would have beforehand, but even more so now to go check Ed out on YouTube and Instagram, especially uh, Ed, give out your information on, on where people can follow you and subscribe so that they can go check you out. Yeah, you can check me out on Instagram. It's Ed610 underscore. Couldn't get the Ed610. Somebody Too took bad. that. So you got to add Too the specs. underscore at the end. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube is Ed610. Uh, Twitter, Ed610, I think. I never check Twitter. Don't even follow me there. Uh, <laughs> Um, what else do we got? Snapchat. I actually post some good, like workout videos and stuff on Snapchat. My Snapchat is sexy. Bad <laughs> I love it. Very important. <laughs> Hell yeah. Awesome. Guys, check Ed out, please. Definitely follow him on Instagram and YouTube, especially he's got some really cool shit that he posts on there. But Ed, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on here. Getting to know you more for me personally. I definitely am going to keep in contact with you and keep talking with you. And I really hope that we can have you on again moving forward. So if there's anything else you want to say before we sign off, go for it. Hell yeah. No, I appreciate you having me. I mean, this has been a great talk. I think we definitely got yes. to get on again, do some deeper dives, get more into the nitty gritty of the, the PED use, because I mean, I think that's what people really yes. want to see. So I'm excited to get to start talking about that some more. And man, I just, Hell it's been yeah. real. I've, I've known you for like a while now, believe it or not, from my early days of research. But it's great to actually sit down and get to talk to you. So this is this is all. Absolutely, brother. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this. Ed will be back. Make sure that you check him out and stay tuned for plenty more to come. Dylan Jamelli signing off.